This series is a critical commentary about an expired fundraising effort from Orbital Assembly on netcapital.com, their third in two years. This is not investment advice. The facts we present come mainly from their own pitch deck materials, as well as third-party websites, online biography pages, and SEC filings. As always, with any financial or investment decision, do your own due diligence to come to your own conclusions. Orbital Assembly's third funding round was their weakest to date, after maxing out their deadline yet again. There are several factors that may have played into this. First red flag may have been the ridiculous valuation the company assigns itself. At the very top of the Orbital Assembly profile in the right-hand column, they display a valuation for the company, and people are expected to take this at face value. However, this number is absolutely meaningless and self-assigned. If you click on the info button, another frame pops up, and it tells you. The price of the securities was determined solely by management and bears no relation to traditional measures of valuation, such as book value or price-to-earnings ratios. We expect that any future valuation will take the same approach. So the company says the company is worth $171 million because the company says it's worth $171 million, and you're just supposed to believe that. But there is no chance this company, with no products or services available, that has never made a penny in revenue, would ever be worth $171 million or even a very small fraction of that amount. If you need confirmation of this, you need only dig a little deeper because all the information is available in filings you can download, and we're going to get to those shortly. The second red flag, you'll notice from the previous segments that the second round of shares were selling at $0.42, cents, and the third round is set at $2.10 per share. Some investors saw this jump and wanted to take some profit on their shares, but there's two problems with that. The first problem is that net capital does not allow you to sell your shares, according to Tim Alatore. At least for the time being, you're stuck with those puppies after you've paid for them. Your only ability to sell them will come after they IPO. But even on this point, Tim Alatore is not consistent. In this comment to Edward Motts, Tim tells Edward that Orbital Assembly is not going to IPO. But a year ago, Tim told Carol Ann Chassie that after they go to IPO would be the only time when Carol Ann could sell or transfer her shares. And then Tim ignored her follow-up question about if they would be publicly listed. Two years ago, Christian Pfeiffer asked a similar question. When will OAC be available to purchase on stock brokerage websites? And the answer Tim gave two years ago was, Our stock will be available on brokerage websites once we do our IPO and are listed on an exchange such as the NYSE. So you can understand why there might be some frustration among those investors who can't actually sell their stakes in the company, especially when the answers given are inconsistent. The second problem is, unknown it seems to many of the investors in the comments section, OAC did a couple of things behind the scenes that we need to walk you through. People checking up on their OAC shares on the net capital dashboard found that they had suddenly lost 80% of their share count because for whatever reason, OAC did a five to one reverse split last year. Daniel Smythe purchased 3,660 shares in the first round for $0.25 cents per, but found that his account now only held 732 shares at $1.25 value, so Daniel won't be investing any further in this company. And David Rodriguez bought 400 shares during an earlier round. He was a little pissed when it turned out he only holds 80 shares now. With the 5 to 1 reverse split, Orbital Assembly moved the offered share price from $0.42 cents to 5 times that, which is the $2.10 from this round. So even if Edward Motts from the comments section could sell his shares now, as he requested, at this price per share, he would only break even, minus whatever transaction costs were involved. Here's the other thing Orbital Assembly did that some people weren't aware of either. On August 30th of 2022, Orbital Assembly CEO Rhonda Stevenson signed a certificate of merger that replaced Orbital Assembly Corporation based in California with a new company called Above Orbital Incorporated out of Delaware for which there seems to be almost no information online. Above Orbital Incorporated is listed as the surviving entity. Orbital Assembly Corporation is listed as the disappearing entity. The name Above Orbital Incorporated does not appear on the Orbital Assembly website contact page. It does not appear on the web page entitled About OAC, which still uses the name Orbital Assembly Corporation, six months after the merger. 
and above does not appear on the investors page either. The month this merger occurred, Orbital Assembly issued no press releases informing their shareholders or followers about this change in corporate structure. So it would appear that there was no disclosure at the time by way of press release, nor currently any disclosure on their website to let people know these changes have been made. Meaning the shares that Net Capital is selling are for a company name in the title header that no longer exists. And the new company doesn't even know what to call itself in the paperwork because two different names pop up. The only place you see any mention of this on the Net Capital profile is under terms, way towards the bottom of their very long scrolling profile, where the company is referred to now as Above Space Development Corporation doing business as Orbital Assembly. Of course, that name doesn't even match up with the name on the merger certificate. How come? That's another twist we'll get to in a bit. Now, under terms, you'll notice that the implied valuation is reached by multiplying 81,972,841 shares by the $2.10 to get the absolutely ridiculous $172 million valuation. But on the merger form, they only list 20,211,708 shares attached to Orbital Assembly Corporation pre-merger, a difference of 61,761,133 shares off by a factor of 4.06. In fact, this 81 million number on their net capital profile does not align with any other share count we've come across. ASDC generated 175 million common and 75 million preferred shares at the time they were incorporated. Above Orbital Incorporated in the merger filing claims to only have 1,000 shares making up the company. So where does this 81 million number come from? If anyone can explain where this number comes from, by all means, put it in the comment feed. We found one possible reason why this number is so far out of whack in their CPA documents and also in their discussion feed, because we are not the only people who read these things. Keith F. Ashland wrote an amazing comment that he deserves full credit for that goes through how the company, after the 5 to 1 reverse split, then gifted 26 unnamed parties a total of 68 million shares or an average of $5.5 million in paper to each of the 26 unnamed parties which immediately watered down OAC shares back to where they were before the reverse split. Key's second paragraph lays it all out perfectly. By then issuing slash gifting an additional 68 million shares to a select group of 26 individual slash entities, you effectively watered down the intrinsic value for all previous net capital shareholders, probably by 75%. Even if you claim to have artificially kept the price elevated at 210 per share, this is irrelevant to the concept of intrinsic value. You cannot simply snap your fingers and create a 325% increase in company valuation from 40.25 million to 171042967 over a 3 to 5 month period without raising a penny of new capital for the company and not lower the real intrinsic value by 75%. One has to wonder, what would the effect have been on the stock price of any publicly traded company if actions like these had been exposed? Is there even a precedent out there for this? And what was Tim Alatori's response? Keith, I can't make any announcements yet, but good things are in process. One vague sentence which addressed exactly none of Keith's points of concern. In fact, the entire discussion feed is like that. Tim Alatori is the primary responder in the comments section for Orbital Assembly and he rarely seems to have any proper answers for people who have concerns, or at least none that he likes to share. Quite often, he tries to get his own investors to shut up on the feed by suggesting they contact him directly at his email address, as he did here. And the reason he does this is so he can keep these serious and legitimate concerns off of the public feed. A lot of these people on the discussion page had no idea their shares had been compressed by a factor of five, and fewer still were aware of the 68 million shares that got doled out. Now, regardless of what they call this company, or how many times management reverse splits their shares, or how badly they dilute the share count with gifts to unnamed people and organizations, this could be mitigated somewhat if the company was up and running and making a profit. But it's not, and their books are bleeding red ink. To Net Capital's credit, they do make financial filings available for all to see, but you do have to know where to look. If you go to Orbital Assembly's Net Capital page and click here on Updates, it takes you to this page. Click here on Filing Form CA and it brings up this SEC page where you can download all these documents as PDFs for free. This is all publicly available information. The CPA audit report is the key here, but first, there's a Certificate of Incorporation file here as well, which is for the new company that can't keep its name straight, dated June 16th of 2022. This document is for Above Space Development Corporation, 
Two months after that incorporation letter was signed in Delaware, under another name, Stevenson filed the Certificate of Merger, which disappeared Orbital Assembly Corporation into the new entity above Orbital Incorporated. On their inception date, ASDC had no listed assets nor liabilities. They created 175 million common stock with none issued and 75 million preferred stock, all with a par value of 10 shares to the penny. There was absolutely nothing to this company at all, but the shares were already valued on paper at a combined quarter million dollars. At least when John Blinkhouse started up Orbital Assembly in 2019, he kicked in $500 of his own money to get the party started. This brand new company with no assets whatsoever absorbed Orbital Assembly Corporation and the $172 million worth of shares as defined on their offering page. On page 3 of the audit report, under Note 1, we learned why the names of the new company go back and forth. According to Note 1, Above Orbital Incorporated is a different company that was incorporated on the same day as Above Space Development Corporation on June 16th of 2022. But Above Orbital Incorporated's letter from the Secretary of State of Delaware legitimizing the incorporation was not part of the downloadable incorporation package. These are the pages of that entire PDF as it appears on the SEC website. Above Orbital Incorporated claims to be a wholly owned subsidiary of Above Space Development Corporation and Above Orbital Incorporation absorbed OAC in the merger, which is in turn owned by Above Space Development Corporation. If you're having trouble picturing this, compare it to an onion. We started off with Orbital Assembly Corporation in the middle. They apparently dropped the corporation from their name to become a DBA that merged into Above Orbital Incorporated, and that company is owned entirely by another corporation created on the same date called Above Space Development Corporation. So now, Orbital Assembly is a shell inside another shell, and that shell is owned entirely by a corporation called Above Space Development Corporation. Now the overarching question here is, does everybody who contributed money to any of these three funding rounds labeled Orbital Assembly actually know which of these entities they currently hold shares of? Starting on Note 1 for ASDC on June 16th of 2022, this brand new company that had absolutely no cash nor assets in their inception report made this statement. The company specializes in turnkey construction services in low Earth and cislunar orbit. Additionally, the company provides construction support services and tools to other private space companies and government space agencies. They do not say the company intends to supply these goods and services, which would qualify as a forward-looking statement. Instead, they use the present tense in this declaration that has no basis in reality at all. If they were presently supplying goods and services to customers, they would be able to show income, something OAC has never been able to do in four years. Which brings us to note two, going concern and uncertainties. This section tells the reader what the viability of the business is as a going concern. Despite how this term sounds, it's a little backwards, but as a company, you want to be a going concern. But for this newly formed company that has incurred no losses and has not commenced its principal operations nor ever made a dime in revenue, the CPA can only say that the company's ability to continue as a going concern is dependent upon management's ability to raise capital from the issuance of debt or sale of equity, its ability to commence profitable sales of its flagship products and services, and its ability to generate positive cash flow. We heard earlier from NASA what they thought about Orbital Assembly's management and their ability to raise funds or manage large projects. They were not impressed. The next paragraph informs the reader that the company intends to conduct what they call additional offerings, also pursuing grant applications through various government agencies, as well as seeking government-backed loan guarantees and private debt financing. What do they not state as an intention? Commencing profitable sales of its flagship products to generate positive cash flow. So according to this CPA letter, the only way this company can stay afloat is by taking in more outside money directly through financing rounds or by doing it through government grant applications and making the taxpayer pay for it. Note 4 again reiterates the 175 million common and 75 million preferred shares in the parent corporation, each with a par value of one-tenth of a cent, giving the company a collective value of $250,000. They claim here the company had not issued any of those shares. But note 5 is where we find out that prior to the merger, and noted after the 5 to 1 reverse split, a total of 68,207,551 shares of common stock were issued to 26 individuals and entities at a supposed fair market value of 210 per share. 
These individuals and entities are not named in this note, so we can't tell you who they are, but for every photo in this graphic, it represents a different person or company that received, on average, $5.5 million in paper wealth. This number, 68,207,551, is in the ballpark of the discrepancy we noted of 61,761,133, the difference between the number of shares on the merger document and the number of shares on the net capital profile. The difference between those two numbers is about 6.5 million shares. And note 5 is the last note in this particular report for Above Space Development Corporation. But if you scroll down, you can see the 2021 numbers for Orbital Assembly Corporation ending December 31st of 2021, before the merger, conducted by the same accounting firm. This time, right in their cover letter, they indicate the following concern about Orbital Assembly Corporation. The company has incurred losses from inception and has not yet commenced its principal operations and has indicated that substantial doubt exists about the company's ability to continue as a going concern. Management's evaluation of the events and conditions and management's plans regarding these matters are also described in Note 2. Pages 2 and 3 of this report denote the balance sheet and statement of operations for OAC. Statements of operations show absolutely no revenue and a net loss of about $1.37 million, which was countered by additional paid-in capital from the previous funding rounds, which left them with a little pad left over. The lion's share of that money went to employee wages and professional fees and consulting. Who those enriched professional consultants were is not mentioned. Add all those numbers together, and at the end of 2021, the company did not have enough money left in the bank on December 31st of 2021 to pay its employees through 2022. Since we have this breakdown, let's compare how OAC told people they intended to spend the money they raised versus how they actually spent the money. On their second net capital round, OAC hoped to raise $4 million by selling shares at $0.42 cents per. If they raised the $4 million, over $3 million of it was going to be spent on salaries, but that payday got cancelled for everyone when they only raised about $1.3 million. And going down the list, there are notable expenses that were significantly higher in the accounting worksheet than on the use of proceeds chart. Despite making a third of what they had hoped for on the raise, their marketing expenses came in at almost two and a half times higher, 152k versus 63k. Their professional fees paid went up about 2.7 times, from 157k to 423k. And their travel expenses were double what they were supposed to be, going from 19k to 39k. Engineering and development, presumably of the flagship products and services they're still not selling, was allocated only one-third of what OAC paid out in professional fees and consulting. Although, to be fair, in the use of proceeds chart from the second round, engineering and development was not mentioned at all. Seriously, there's no R&D included in their use of proceeds when they were expecting a $4 million windfall. Now, if your company is spending more money on consultants and marketing than you are on developing the concepts in the CGI images that you're supposed to be selling for profit, are you really a space station design team or are you just keeping professional consultants employed? Going into the 2021 notes for OAC in note one, they make the same claim that their parent company made previously. The company specializes in turnkey construction services in low earth and cislunar orbit. Additionally, the company provides construction support services and tools to other private space companies and government space agencies. They're apparently so good at providing these goods and services that they failed to make a single penny in revenue in 2021 and had to pay close to half a million dollars that year to outside professional consultants. The rest of Note 1 summarizes the significant accounting policies and Note 2 lands on page 9. Again, the audit reiterates the CPA going concern warning about the company. And this reads a little differently than the parent company one did. The company has incurred losses during the period of approximately $1,368,394 and has not yet commenced its principal operations and primarily relies on outside sources to fund operations, which, among other factors, introduces risk related to the company's ability to continue as a going concern. The ability of the company to continue as a going concern is dependent upon management's plans to raise additional capital from the issuance of debt or sale of equity, its ability to commence profitable sales of its flagship products and services, and its ability to generate positive operating cash flow. 
The following paragraph does not indicate the company was in any position to start offering the flagship goods and services for sale. Its primary sources of income to date were funded by their net capital crowdfunding to the tune of $995,000 for the first raise in 2021 and $1,325,750 in the second round wrapping in 2022. Now here we are in their third round and far fewer people are falling for this company's sales pitch. The last note of this report, note 6, subsequent events, goes through the stock manipulation that occurred as a result of the merger with Above Orbital Incorporated, owned by Above Space Development Corporation, again outlining the distribution of 68 million shares across 26 individuals and entities without naming any of them or the uncompensated work they supposedly did. One final note about the numbers to mention before leaving this section behind, because this could be very important moving forward and could accelerate Orbital Assembly's need to IPO or search for other venture capital while still having next to nothing to show from past raises. At the end of 2021, after the funding rounds were accounted for, OAC had about $360,000 in cash and equivalents and prepaid expenses in the kitty. If you add that 36106 to the 145469 they raised with this third net capital effort, Keeping in mind, Above Space Development Corporation brought zero cash to the game according to their filing, and that leaves Orbital Assembly unable to cover even its wages and rent payment in 2023. That's what the publicly available audit reports tell you. Time now to tidy up a couple loose ends. As part of the research done during this episode, we came across this year-old article on OAC's own newsfeed, and it was to do with their relocation to Huntsville, Alabama in order to receive a $3 million incentive package. According to the Huntsville-Madison County Chamber, their listed address is 4100 Market Street Southwest, Suite 100, Huntsville, Alabama. So we googled that address to see what their new headquarters is going to look like. Want to guess what we found? Yeah, it's another FlexSpace co-working office called Spaces, and you can get a free quote for your own space at offices.net. At least it wasn't another damned UPS store. So in this article, this passage caught our attention. Huntsville was selected after a rigorous search for a variety of reasons. As home to hundreds of aerospace companies and vendors, it offers a highly experienced technical workforce. Many of the company's partners, ULA, Sierra Space, Boeing, Aerojet Rocketdyne, and others are located there. Of course, we've gone through what we think of their ULA, Sierra Space, and AR partnership claims already, but this was the first time we've heard OAC refer to Boeing as one of their partners. So we reached out to the press contact on the article, Andrew Lavin of A. Lavin Communications. A 516 area code puts him in Port Washington, New York, not California where the company is now, and not Alabama where the company is supposed to be moving to. No, he's somewhere on Haven Avenue in Port Washington, probably within walking distance to this Starbucks in Port Plaza. We wanted to know if Andy had any documents to support OAC's published claims that they were in fact partners with any of these companies and we heard back from him. Apparently our timing was good because he had just been alerted to our renewed interest in Orbital Assembly. Seems this group doesn't like people asking questions, and although he claimed they would answer any questions as best we can to the extent we can, of course he didn't provide any of the details we asked for. Instead, he made the choice to hide behind a nonsense excuse of this being confidential information where these agreements are concerned. The reason why this would be a nonsense excuse is because the company chose to publish claims stating partnerships with some of the biggest names in aerospace, which gives us the right as journalists to ask for confirmation and validation of that claim. This frame from their pitch deck says the company purports to have 19 MOU and LOI, those are Memoranda of Understanding and Letters of Intent, from customers. If that's true, then all those memoranda and letters should be in appendix in your prospectus. And if you can't, or if you won't, provide them to people upon request, then don't be surprised when people don't take you at your word. At any rate, we don't expect Andy will be of much use where information collection is concerned. However, on the off chance that he's not totally useless in this regard, we asked him again for confirmation of partnership with those four particular companies and what their interest was in OAC, as well as a reasonable explanation of why John Blinkow was expunged from the company he founded in late 2019 with his own $500. Maybe we get answers back, probably not, and we're not holding our breath, especially since Tim Alatore had some comments to make about our channel in the comments section of the Net Capital discussion page. 
About a month ago, Robert Eckrick put up a post suggesting people check out our orbital disassembly series done shortly after OAC's first funding round. This was Tim Alatoria's response. Yes, we are very familiar with these videos and their creator. The amount of misinformation, false assumptions, lies, and just plain bad math and engineering knowledge would be comical if it didn't persuade so many people. Apparently, Tim would prefer to lay their failings and unkept promises off on our channel instead of recognizing their own shortcomings, like refusing to answer questions properly in the discussion page from supporters of their fundraising campaigns. Or even better, remember earlier we mentioned that previous investors of OAC on the discussion page of Orbital Assembly's campaign were upset that they weren't directly informed of the stock reverse split. And as we were combing through the page, we came across this response from Tim Alatori on the matter. Tim told Rada that the notice of the reverse split came from Net Capital on November 22, 2022. So we went looking through our own emails to see if that was indeed the case. We found this email from November 22 of 22 from Net Capital. Nothing in that email other than Orbital Assembly has made a new announcement. Click here to find out more. So we clicked here. That took us back to their Net Capital page for this message, for our investors link, which again you had to click on. Open that up, the box folds down, and here, buried several clicks in from the original email, is a PDF you have to download called Message for Net Capital Investors. And if you click here, you finally get to the message that should have been in the original email in the first place because it was kind of important. This one-page letter from Tim Alatori listed four different announcements. First, it says the company has redomiciled from California to Delaware. It fails to disclose that Orbital Assembly Incorporated has merged with Above Orbital Incorporated at that time and that Above Orbital was the surviving entity of the merger. Second, it mentions how the company had issued the vast majority of the previously authorized shares, resulting in what Tim called some dilution. He failed to disclose the number of shares that were issued or to whom. Third, the reverse stock split is announced as going from $0.42 cents to $2.10 per share, but the wording of 5 to 1 reverse split is never mentioned. And finally, they announce a couple of patents with no further description. Now look at the date of the letter, November 22nd of 2022, and let's check the calendar for when these events actually happened. On June 16th of 2022, the company officers formed two new related corporations that were not even mentioned in this announcement. Then two months later, Rhonda Stevenson signed a merger form on August 30th of 2022 to disappear Orbital Assembly Incorporated, which was confirmed by the Delaware Secretary of State on September 2nd. The 5 to 1 reverse stock split, according to the CPA audit letters, happened before the merger, and at around the same time those 68 million shares were distributed to 26 mystery people. So all that happened prior to August 30th. This letter from Tim Alatori is dated November 22nd of 2022. Take a guess what else happened on that date. That just so happens to be the exact same date their latest net capital round started up and when they had to file with the SEC to be compliant. So all of these major events were disclosed months after the fact and likely only because they had to file a true and accurate document with the SEC that would be linked to through net capital. And even then, rather than send out an email that had all this information, Tim Alatori buried it to the point where you had to click on the email, click on the link, open the headline, drop down the article, then download and open a PDF to read an incomplete synopsis of what the company had been doing behind the scenes for the previous five months. In this comment, Tim points to some people that have come on board recently with OA as proof positive that his company is for real. He encourages people to check out the team they've put together. So we did. The first name on the list is Jeff Max. Jeffrey Max is the new CEO of Ascent Solar Technologies, having taken that position in September of 2022. And this is the five-year stock chart he inherited. The all-time high stock chart for ASTI is even more whacked out, with shares in the company at one time somehow worth billions of dollars apiece according to this chart, and now they trade at under four bits. Anybody running a company with a chart like this should be looking for any side gig that comes along just in case. Like when he and six other people from Life Size Special Opportunities Master Fund Limited tried in December of 2022 to overthrow the entire board at Diffusion Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. This letter was issued to Diffusion stockholders, telling them that the entire board had to be refreshed with Jeffrey and friends. Since the board of directors page on the Diffusion website doesn't include Max and his buddies, we're assuming that coup was unsuccessful, which freed Jeffrey up for this gig. 
His biography in this shareholder letter outlines his current post at Ascent Solar, along with other posts that also appear on his LinkedIn profile. According to LinkedIn, in 2019, Jeffrey left the CEO position at Resolve in New York two years before that e-commerce website IPO'd in 2021. He left to become chairman and CEO at Agile Space Industries, and he lasted there for a little over two and a half years. His profile states that he is a managing partner at La Plata Capital Partners LLC in Durango, Colorado, and a senior advisor at LIIV, however that's supposed to be pronounced. Both those pieces of information are outdated, according to the coup letter, that says he is a former associate of both. To confirm this, we looked up La Plata Capital, and sure enough, he's been removed from the company and their website. So Jeffrey has four past positions and a failed coup in the past three years, which could be indicative of his attention span. And just putting this out there, when you're the CEO of a company that has a stock chart that is down 95% in the past year, you should probably spend more time tending to your own backyard rather than taking board positions with other companies. Who's up next? Frank White. He's an author and philosopher and communications consultant. The company he co-founded called Brodeer Space Group was created specifically to market startup space companies by SEO coattailing names like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. This global brand building powerhouse has 884 followers on Twitter. If that's the best that Frank White can do marketing on social media, maybe keep the day job teaching fundraising to college kids at Harvard during summer school. Jeff Greeson, we've already covered him. He's been involved with OAC for at least two years, although he doesn't bother mentioning it on LinkedIn. Two years after the initial funding round when he was introduced as an advisor, and what do they have to show for it? Andre Bormanis is a TV producer who's done work with the Orville and the Star Trek TV and film franchise. He's a legit science guy that became a science consultant for TV shows and film. He was a writer for Star Trek Voyager for 133 episodes, which means this is the guy who anytime he couldn't figure out how to save Janeway and the crew, his fallback to save the day is a phase variance. If you know, you know. Andre got the dream gig, but seeing as how teleporters, warp drives, and replicators still haven't made their way into reality, what is his actual real-world area of expertise, and how does his participation benefit the board? Next up is Janet Ivey. The creator of Janet's Planet is a great role model for kids, with her show airing on more than 140 public TV stations. But despite being president at Explore Mars, she is not a rocket scientist. She's an art major, with a bachelor's in music and theater that seems to be double-posted on her profile. So add this actor-teacher to the sci-fi producer-writer from Star Trek and the marketing genius author with the weak Twitter profile, and what exactly are they supposed to be able to advise on? Which brings us to Tom Spilker, the CTO of Orbital Assembly, who's their JPL name drop for presentations. However, if we're being honest, since Tom's wife Linda started at JPL before him, and continues to work at JPL long after Tom retired, and since according to his LinkedIn profile, Tom was unable to get another full-time gig after JPL, Linda has the far more impressive resume. After JPL, looks like Tom did one year consulting for space mission architectures and proposals, and afterwards hooked up with John Blinkow in the early days of the Gateway Foundation and Orbital Assembly. When Blinkow started taking money from people to get on the crew list for Gateway Spaceport, you know that giant space hotel whose concept has been completely abandoned. Now, Tom Spilker might not have been a washout at JPL, but that is certainly how his LinkedIn profile presents him. And you may think that's a brutal assessment, but for someone who is supposed to be the OAC NASA genius on file, their chief technical officer and their vice chair. According to his own online profile, the guy hasn't had a steady gig in the space sector for over a decade during the space privatization boom. And if he's the guy suggesting these giant rings are going to somehow travel to Mars, well, it would seem to us that Tom is not particularly grounded in reality. Chances are, over a decade after retiring from JPL, Tom's just happy he can still show his toy rocket to people, even though Tom Spilker had nothing to do with the development of that rocket that he takes everywhere with him. He couldn't have had anything to do with it. That's a model of a Saturn V, and they stopped flying in 1973, while Tom Spilker was taking his Bachelor of Science at KSU from 1971 to 1975. Now to wrap up our comments on what Tim Alatori was saying about us in his comments, if you've followed this channel for any amount of time, you know full well that we show on the screen what we're talking about at the time with the odd comical video clip or movie reference. We show the math. We show the articles. We use outside sources to verify what we're showing our viewers. 
So if Tim or any other person at Orbital Assembly would like to correct any of the information in our previous series or this one, by all means feel free to reach out or comment below and we'll see if the information you provide has any more merit than the material that we have already discovered. And finally, the claim that our previous episodes have persuaded many people would be remarkable since at the time we aired Orbital Disassembly, this channel only had 5,000 subscribers. We didn't do a series based on your second funding round at all. So this is the first time in two years that we've spent any significant amount of time looking into Orbital Assembly or whatever name you're going by now. Apparently, this breakdown was long overdue. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic, which more than anything was an exercise on how to do your own due diligence when it comes to investing in startup companies like this. There is so much information out there for people to read over, and they just don't bother, preferring instead to blindly throw their money at companies making outrageous promises whose biggest assets are CGI models. Then when their money or the company disappears, they're all left scratching their heads. You would think that with all the press Orbital Assembly has received over the years, that at some point, someone in the mainstream media would have done a deeper dive on these guys, but nope, they just quote them verbatim, and they leave the dirty work to the independents. And that's fine, we'll take it from here, because somebody has to. If you found this information helpful and entertaining, please give the video a like. If you know someone who can use information like this, share the video link with them. If you'd like to support future productions directly, visit our Patreon page. The link is in the video description. And if you want to be notified about future productions, ring the notification bell and subscribe so that you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.